Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, NASA's Gene Lab Project, Public Access to Spaceflight Omics Data. It is presented by Sigrid Reinch, PhD, a scientist in the Space Biosciences Research Branch at NASA. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reinsch. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hello, um, thank you for joining me. Um, today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about Gene Lab, um, which is our project for open science for exploration. Um, it is, that project is housed out of NASA Ames Research Center in California. And um, I wanna just first acknowledge the members of the project that have contributed very much to this. Uh, Dr. Sylvain Costes, who is our project manager, uh, Marla Smithick, our deputy project manager, John Galaska, uh, who is a project scientist, and Afshin Behesti, who is also a senior scientist on the project. So um, the brief outline of the talk is I'm gonna first introduce you to some of the challenges of space flight, then talk about the opportunities of omics technologies, and then all the bulk of the talk is going to go into the gene lab itself, what, is, what the project is, uh, the components of our data system and our uh, data system development, how we generate data for the project, and then finally, the science that we can get out of the gene lab project. So first, the, the challenges of, of space flight so this little diagram kind of shows the challenges of human spaceflight and, and the, the little human icon um, is in the center of all of these different little images. So the, the, main, the, main, uh, the main risks to humans uh, exploration of space have to do with all of these different, five different components that NASA's human research program has defined and they, they define them as risks, um, and these are the risks that's, that spaceflight experiments hope to address in terms of uh, enabling us to get uh, into beyond Earth orbit, to Mars, um, to really do have long-term exploration of space. So these are hostile closed environments, um, isolation and confinement, the distance from Earth, space radiation, and gravity fields. So um, I'll go into actually, especially space radiation, um, a little bit further along in the talk. Um, and I'll touch on some of these others, these other issues as well. Um, so the opportunities of space of omics data. Um, so um, omics is the, the study of, as you know, um, the biomolecules, uh, DNA, RNA, protein, uh, the metabolites, et cetera. And um, a number of years ago, the, in the 2011 NRC Decadal Survey, uh, the mission of Gene Lab was basically designed. Um, and so they basically identified as a requirement that genomics um, and transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics offer an immense opportunity to understand the effects of spaceflight on biological systems and that um, the data should be able to be mined and analyzed uh, for information by multiple researchers. 
And this gave birth to Gene Lab as a public database idea to maximize the amount of data that we could get from every biological experiment in space. And now actually omics acquisition in space is, is a reality. Um, it started initially with being able to do um, smart PCR, um, QRT PCR on, on ISS, um, and being able to actually using a, our sample, sample preparation module to actually go from tissues or cells all the way to DNA, um, RNA, and protein. And more recently, um, we've had we've been able to do mini PCR um, run experiments by students, and also the the Oxford nanopore, the MinION gene sequencer to actually sequence genes in space. And so this technology actually um, is is a really important um, development for the advancement of technologies in space and the ability to use omics analyses on board ISS or whatever space vehicle. Um, but right now we do all of the analysis on the ground and, and um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So um, Gene Lab is a data system. Um, this is the kind of the big picture of Gene Lab, and it has a number of different components. And I'm going to talk you through this slide. You'll see it multiple times during the talk as I touch on the different components. Um, right now, Gene Lab hosts primarily raw data. So those are gene, gene sequences, RNA sequences, proteome um, reads, uh, metabolomic uh, mass spectra, et cetera. So we, um, those data are really currently, if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, interpretable by data, sci data scientists. And what one of the goals of, of Gene Lab is to actually really democratize that data so that it can be interpreted by biologists and um, who are not necessarily bioinformaticians, and then even by ci citizen scientists who are interested in um, understanding what happens in space to our genes. So, <clears throat> so the, the Gene Lab is actually, um, has had a phased implementation. The first um, implementation of our database was released in 2015 um, to be able to house a, a number of data sets. Um, and it really uh, was very top level um, and, and trying to understand actually what, what type of data would go into the database. Um, in phase two was recently completed and in, in those phases um, we had data, you know, being able to download the data and uh, federate the data. We're now in phase three and in phase three we are going to be incorporating tools. Um, we plan to be releasing a data, database uh, in the fall um, which will uh, incorporate tools that the users can use. So um, here are some of the milestones uh, that I'll talk about in our talk. AWG is our anal analysis working group. We're gonna be having some summer interns who are gonna help us with tool development and pipeline development. Um, and we are gonna be releasing in um, October uh, the, our version 3.0 at the ASGSR meeting, which is the American Society for Gravitational and Space Research. And then next year, we are going to be releasing um, a version with a visualization portal. So I'll be going through all of this in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first thing is the, the phase two release, which right now has a Google-like search and um, federated search. So right now on the left, you see um, an image of our database with some, some data sets in there. And actually what you see are not just, there's a GeneLab data set at the bottom, which has the little rodent icon. You will also see three data sets from GEO. So you can actually search across multiple databases by searching in our, on the GeneLab website. Um, and you can, within the GeneLab website, but uh, not including the other databases, um, GEO and, and GRAST, um, you can actually do filters for, for the Gene Lab data sets. So the next um, item that I'm going to be talking about are the different types of data. And um, oh actually, so the meta, actually the metadata. So our, one of the aspects of our database is that we have very well curated 
uh, metadata. And um, so we use the is a, is a curator and in our phase two release, uh, one of the one of the main things that we did was we released it on an instance of um, genome space. And what that has allowed us to do is to have a much faster um, data processing operation to actually get data into the data, into our database, and um, to really have a lot of um, very specific uh, controlled vocabulary for our metadata and using, um, you know, using ontologies from, um, from various sources um, to be able to control the data. So what you see are some images of the, is a creator um, that, the, that the user would use. The user would, if you were putting data into GeneLab, this is the um, form that you would use to get your data into GeneLab um, that curates specifics about assay type, um, the sample names, the, the actual protocols, and when you go to our website, you can actually download a copy of Visit Creator and use that to view the data within our data sets. So what kind of data do we have in GeneLab? Right now we have um, 166 data sets, and they're distributed by, they're, we've had a huge uh, data growth in the, in the last several years. Um, some of it is, is data that uh, we, have put in, and a lot of it comes from uh, spaceflight researchers around the world that we have pulled in also from other sources, such as um, GEO. So um, by species, you see that the bulk of our data are mouse and, um, and plants, and we ha do have some human uh, data sets. Uh, we have um, the majority of our data is actually spaceflight samples, and then, of, and the majority is also transcriptomics, uh, and of that, most of that currently is microarray data, but that will be shifting uh, over the over the time. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have 69 ground data sets, and those are primarily radiation and simulated microgravity data sets. And um, we have had a big push in the last year to include as many radiation data sets um, as possible. Um, and that's because this is one of the major, um, the major risks for space flight, and I'll go into that a little bit further. Um, these these uh, images are actually from a paper that was re recently published as a commentary in radiation research, um, and so you can go there to read that commentary a little bit more. So um, this little graphic shows, oh, my film didn't come through, sorry. But basically that um, that the Earth's gravitational field actually shields us from a lot of the cosmic rays and radiation. And at the bottom of the, at the bottom of this image, you can see that, um, that actually, um, a, that actually is a, a space mission outside the Earth's, um, gravitational field would really have huge consequences in terms of exposure to radiation. So um, one of our big pushes, in, in, as well as including as many uh, ground radiation data sets, is to include dosimetry data from um, as many different sources as we can for spaceflight data. And this, uh, this, these, little, these images show at the bottom of the um, the bottom image shows those symmetry locations on the space shuttle. So we have a number of, of data sets from the space shuttle and we've completed the tallying of data from those dosimeters and actually included them with the data sets that um, are in our um, system. And so on the right hand side, you can see the different types of data sets that we have um, in our system and these are Currently, we only have the dosimetry data for the space shuttle. We will get, uh, we'll be incorporating um, dosimetry data from the International Space Station in the near future. So here you can see different organisms plotted on here, humans at the top to uh, microbes at the bottom and the number of different data sets that we have from those organisms and the total dose of radiation that they've received. Um, so you can see that we have a, a, a number of spaceflight data uh, that incorporates radi radiation dosimetry. 
Um, so, and if you want to actually see that data, this is a this is the view of our website again. Um, you can click on the tab that's called environmental data and go to that. And what you'll see is a display like this that shows each individual flight um, that or experiment and the, the GLDS number on the left is an, each one is an individual investigation. And then the dosimetry data from that from each of those individual dosimeters and the averages um, that we will that we use to interpret. So uh, going through this um, a little bit further, I'm going to tell you some more about um, how we actually get data into our system. And so uh, we have this, this uh, in this release, we have this collab NASA Collaborative Workspace. Um, and so, so users can go in and actually create an account and they can upload their data um, to the Gene Lab system through that um, mechanism. And so this is our current mechanism for incorporating data into our account. So if you have a, if you are an investigator that has space flight or space flight relevant data, then this is the mechanism that you would use to actually get into uh, to get your data uploaded into our system. So um, in the we also have this the Galaxy platform, and this Galaxy platform is um, a huge barrier, or it's a, a huge solution to the great barriers that we had for um, being able to analyze um, and and uh, analyze large amounts of data uh, rapidly and allow that as a user interface. So um, some of the barriers to um, omics to the analysis of omics data are that they're, the large files are difficult to move around and process, and workflows vary from user to user, and the details are sometimes very poorly documented. So the Galaxy platform solves uh, a lot of these. It's an open source, extensible platform for cloud-based analysis of omics data. So everything happens in the cloud. Uh, users can drag and drop. Um, uh, basically, the, the the images of the files, but without actually having to move the data around, and so you don't have to upload and download data to your computer in order to do the analyses. So it allows a lot of um, command line, uh, very a lot of flexibility in tool or scripts, um, reproducibility of using those pipelines, um, and I'll talk a lot more about that. The workflows can be published, shared, and downloaded, and and. So this is a, a huge push uh, right now in GeneLab is actually getting and vetting the tools that are going into our Galaxy project um, and making sure that those tools run on all the different types of, of data, making sure that the the data names are um, the data set names are have have are properly described, um, and so that we can really develop a. a a very fast and flexible um, workspace for users to be able to analyze data and um, for us to be able to actually present uh, process data to our user community. So in the, in the next part, um, let's see, I'm, I've talked about Galaxy and Genome Space. I'm going to talk a little bit about our analysis working groups. So our analysis working groups, um, we recently divided set these up at the beginning of the year, um, and they comprise more than 60 scientists um, at all different levels who are have, uh, most of them have expertise in bioinformatics, either um, transcriptomics, proteomics, um, metagenomics, and we are divided into four different groups. So we have um, a plant group, a microbes group, an animals group, and a multiomics group. and um, we have virtual month monthly meetings um, where each meeting, each group meets individually with their with the team members, um, and we have uh, members from all over the world. So most of our AWG members are in the U.S., but we have a few currently in Europe. We uh, anticipate having more members from around the world as things progress. We recently had um, on AWG, we call them the AWG Analysis Working Groups, we recently had an AWG workshop in Orlando, Florida. That was a huge success where um, our AWG members are helping us to find consensus pathways for the analysis of each of the types of data that we have in our database. 
And so we are, um, those consensus pipelines are what we are gonna be using to actually process data to present as, as process data on our website um, so that we can have um, really a very nice flexibility in terms of the visualization of the data. So, um, so our analysis working groups, this is just kind of a timeline of this year, uh, what's going on. So the, the goal is to answer very specific questions um, and, and to really understand like what are the, what, are the um, what kind of things might be missing from GeneLab right now that, and for them to make recommendations about uh, metadata that might be included or um, not only the, the tool lines that, that I'm sorry, the analysis pipelines, um, but tools that can be that we should be including in our Galaxy workspace to be able to analyze the data. So uh, this summer, uh, the recommendations that the um, that the analysis working groups have come up with are going to be implemented by student interns. We have a whole uh, group of student interns that we're going to be coming this summer and actually crunching a lot of data um, and getting that into our release that will be happening in the fall. Um, and so um, in the coming years that we'll have basically the, the AWG helping us with developing visualization requirements for our visualization system. So that goes to basically to this, uh, uh, the visualization portal that we hope to be released uh, next year. And we still have a lot of questions about uh, how that's, we, we haven't figured out exactly, exactly how we're going to be able to implement the visualization portal. Um, one of the, so on, I'm pulling up, um, basically on the blue side of this, we have the user interface. So the user would be interacting with Galaxy and, and the GeneLab pipelines, and they have their own uh, private workspace where they can either pull in GeneLab data or uh, put their own data up there to analyze in, um, in conjunction with the GeneLab data. Um, on, on the red side, we have GeneLab actually processing data to present to the general public. So we have a high, through, a high, throughput, high throughput platform um, with our, our consensus pipelines that the AWG has developed. And so we will be taking the data from the bottom, from the workspace and actually processing from raw to lower order alignments and then higher order um, differential display or differential gene expression um, and systems analyses. And then ultimately that will go into the, sorry, the visualization portal. Um, and so the, in the, in the lower, um, basically we, currently do not have any human sequences in our database, um, except for what comes from cultured cells or really de-identified human sequences. Um, we do anticipate, we would um, really like to be able to present an astronaut data, um, and it should be possible um, if we can include only higher order data on the public side so that they don't see any of the raw data at all and that we have a very we could have a very controlled access to the raw data so um, back to the outline um, we're going to go into a little bit more about data generation so this is kind of a typical um, pipeline for how data is generated so we have the development of experiment objectives, uh, payload mission definition and implementation for space flight experiments. Then the experiment is performed in space. Um, and then you can have sample preparation on the ground and omic center processing and data curation and release in GeneLab. And so GeneLab has started partnering or has partnered uh, with a number of scientists um, to generate some of the data that is that is involved um, in Gene Lab, so most of the experiment, a lot of the experiments that come through Gene Lab um, uh, are either partners with individual experiment, individual scientists that are funded through NASA's SLIPSRA, which is the Space Life and Physical Sciences um, Research and Applications Division. Um, and also um, partners with CASIS, which is the Center for Advancement of um, Science and Space, which is the commercial side of the International Space Station. 
So these are just a couple of examples um, of, of gene lab collaborations where we collaborated with on uh, BRIC19 and BRIC20 with Simon Gilroy and Sarah Wyatt um, on Arabidopsis experiments. Uh, we also collaborated uh, with, a NASA, with NASA on BRIC23, which was a microbes experiment. Um, and we've had multiple collaborations on the RUN research series of experiments. Uh, which are run by NASA and CASIS. So Rodent Research 1, uh, which was a validation experiment, and Rodent Research 3, which was a, a muscle, particularly a muscle experiment. And um, in these collaborations, um, Gene has, has been able to either augment um, the experiments that were proposed by the, the propo proposed by, um, for instance, by Drs. Gilroy and Wyatt um, to give them uh, more omics analyses than they had had originally proposed, um, or to get samples from the rodent research experiments that are uh, from different tissues than the ones for which the experiments were designed. Um, and those are tissues that are obtained through NASA's bio um, specimen sharing program. <clears throat> And with BRIC23, um, GeneLab did all of the sample processing um, of the microbes in those experiments. So GeneLab has a sample processing laboratory. It's a, it's a standard um, omics processing laboratory for um, generating DNA, RNA protein, um, and doing dissections of, of some of the, the carcasses from the space flight um, samples. Um, our, our technicians are very well trained, and we're responsible for um, generating a huge amount of the data that is in GeneLab. You can see here on this graph, on the on the right hand side, the data from uh, these individual experiments that I spoke to you about: Rodent Research One, Rodent Research Three, Brick Nineteen Twenty, and Twenty Three. So in terms of um, the rodent research experiments, this is just from rodent research one. We also have tissues from rodent research three. Um, this experiment was launched in 2014. It was a validation mission using um, C57 black sick mouse and gene lab obtained um, a, a whole number of tissue, a whole lot of tissues, liver, adrenal eye, gastrocnemius, kidney, quadriceps soleus, and tibias anterioris. Um, and they did, um, RNA-seq, proteomic, and bisulfite sequencing on all of those um, data sets, and all of those data sets are available in GeneLab, so publicly accessible. Anybody can, can download that data and, and analyze it. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I've, I've gotten all the way down to talking about GeneLab science, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, so we this is a general overview of overview of some of the gene lab mouse data. Um, on, the, on the timeline in the middle, you see the number of days in space, and then we have bubbles going up and down from those lines, showing the different tissues from rodents that have been um, sacrificed um, and, and the tissues harvested, and that data is now in gene lab. So above in blue, above the line, the timeline are tissues that were harvested from ISS experiments. And down below are um, rodents that were flown on uh, the space shuttle. So you can see a wide variety of different tissues. Um, all of these, all of the data from these experiments is um, available in GeneLab. So when GeneLab has started to do some of the analysis on these tissues, um, is was that we saw some very expected things. So we saw changes um, to muscles. Um, and so here you just see some um, principal component analysis and, this, and the samples cluster, cluster by tissue. So you see liver down on the bottom right, bottom left, and eye and gastroc and, and, and adrenal are up at the top. And then all the muscle are, are clustered on the right-hand side. So you definitely see um, very expected changes in, in muscle in particular. So if you look at flight versus ground in the graph that I just pulled up, um, the differential gene expression shows that you, you definitely have some changes um, between flight and ground. And here uh, on the graph on the right, uh, blue is flight and red is, is ground. And in particular, we see changes in the myosin um, heavy types in uh, between flight and ground. 
So what, one of the things that we found from analyzing this data were things that we didn't expect. Um, so the first one was what we call cage effects. Um, and this is now published data, recently published in Nature Reports, or uh, Scientific Reports, pardon me. Um, and so this study examined, this is all an analysis of data that's housed in GeneLab publicly available. And what our scientists did was they only looked at actually control experiments. They didn't, they looked at only ground controls in this, in this analysis. And what they compared was the different t cage types. On the left, you see the habitat for the mice that's used in space. Uh, the middle image is just a close-up through the door of what the habitat looks like. And then on the right, you see a standard vivarium cage. Um, and in this analysis, they used um, five different data sets and examined just the ground control um, mice and looked at, at uh, differential gene analysis from a number of different tissues, from um, mostly muscle, and then there was one rat experiment where they used uh, mammary tissue. Uh, so this is the publication, uh, and I recommend that I'm going to go through the data very quickly so you can just go to the publication and actually look at the data yourselves. But the, the main point is that, um, that the analysis of actually the housing suggests that carbon dioxide um, is an environmental stressor in space flight. And the reason that they say that is when, the way that they do the ground experiments is they um, they match, they get recorded data from the International Space Station of exactly uh, the telemetry from the, the CO2 monitoring system, and they match the CO2 concentration in the ground vivarium controls. So, uh, or I'm sorry, in the ground AEM, the, the rodent habitat, um, verse, and, and they don't do that in the vivarium controls. Those are just normal, exposed to, to the laboratory air. Um, whereas in the vivarium, in the in the AEM, they match the the oxygen and uh, CO2 levels exactly. So the mice are exposed to exactly the same ex in, uh, air environment that they would be exposed to on space flight. And so what you can see in the principal component analysis is that there's there's very clear clustering of the vivarium versus the AEM data. Um, and so that it, it suggests a very strong cage effect. Um, and when our scientists actually went in and analyzed the data is that they, they found that upstream regulators and canonical pathways show responses is, is, is very tissue specific. So especially in muscle and has a, um, and is highest for, for high CO2, which is what occurred in the AEM. <clears throat> So these types of experiments need to be confirmed with uh, the same types of experiments, but with ambient uh, CO2 levels to see if those, uh, whether those, whether the stressors, the hypoxia indicators also hold, hold true um, at ambient, C level, ambient uh, CO2 concentrations. So the second unexpected symbol um, had to do with sample preservation um, effects. And this had to do has to do with how um, samples are processed um, on the ISS. So, uh, in a lot of experiments, the, the rodents are flown up and then back down alive. Um, but in some experiments, the the um, the mice are actually sacrificed on the ISS, and the tissues can either be harvested immediately for for various experiments, or the mice are can be just uh, frozen and then brought back down and then uh, briefly and then dissected after uh, the freezing on the ISS. And so, um, so what we uh, Gina did an experiment where uh, we also looked at the at control experiments, looking at the effects of dissecting from frozen tissues. And in our pilot experiment, uh, and combined with uh, the experiment from, from, actually, this is just uh, the flight experiment, looking at the the carcasses that were um, brought down to Earth and then dissected on Earth versus the ones that were dissected in space, and looking at liver, was that there were they actually in the principal component analysis they actually um, were very uh, definitely looked at 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 as different pools. Um, and so this, and the thing is that in the ground controls, the same thing was was noted. So there was a strong separation of differentially expressed genes between the fresh um, 
and, and the frozen tissues, either in space or on the ground, and it was worse in space. So there are 4,000 genes that were in common, principally linked to catabolic pathways, and that kind of um, smells like tissue degradation effects. Um, so this was the pre-validation experiment, um, which was basically looking at tissues uh, frozen um, immediately after section. So in the middle, you see uh, the time after dissection, either as soon as possible or uh, waiting 25 minutes, uh, which is what we anticipated. And it might take an astronaut to be able to uh, dissect um, after dissecting other tissues um, and or um, dissected immediately and then stored for, um, for a year uh, at, at minus 80 degrees. So, the, so in the uh, scenarios at the bottom, they're either, either um, stored for three days after freezing, immediately dissected, stored for a year after a delay, or stored after immediate um, dissection. And so when we compared freezing, these freezing studies, um, what we also found was this very strong um, shift and uh, clustering of the data between those that were dissected from carcasses. So um, what, you, what we show here is both flight and ground. Um, and so the, all the triangles are flight samples, all the circles are ground samples, and um, all the squares are, are what we call basal controls. Um, and those are uh, mice that are um, killed directly before the flight, actually. So they're kind of as, um, they've never experienced the flight, uh, but they've been, been in the uh, habitat for a short amount of time. And so what you can see here are, um, basically we had that, that the, the data clusters with um, things that were frozen versus things that were dissected immediately upon euthanasia. And so, um, there's very little overlap between those two clusters um, to indicate things that happen between flight and ground. So you can see that in the liver, flight and ground samples look very similar, and the big difference is between ones that were dissected immediately or versus those were those were frozen and then dissected after being frozen. So, um, but what we do see in the flight samples, actually, we do see some uh, some. Uh, differences in the liver, so and we can see metabolic pathways that are changed. Um, and one of the things that we've done with the, the livers is some histology to show that actually you have increases in, in oil red stain liver in those samples. Um, and that was also shown in the STS-135 um, uh, uh, flight, um, STS-35, I'm sorry, flight. So um, basically this is, uh, Fuel for future experiments. We are we are in the process of looking at ex, um, doing experiments to to um, understand this effect on the frozen carcasses um, and to see whether we can tease out the the effect a little bit further. Um, so engaging with Gene Lab, how can you participate in the Gene Lab? Um, process and anybody can participate. So you can go to our website and you can explore our data. Um, and coming in the fall, you'll be able to see some of our um, our process uh, process data showing up on the on the um, on the website. You'll also be able to use our tools that are uh, that we're starting to populate and vet um, but haven't been haven't been released to the public. Um, we urge you to look at our social media to, on Facebook, Twitter, and on ResearchGate. We, we post updates um, constantly. And any news and opportunities uh, will be also on the front page of our Gene Lab website. Um, help us uh, democratize this data. Get in there and, and use the data. We hope to be able to go all the way from raw data to understand disease states um, and to be able to tackle those big questions uh, to help us get beyond low Earth orbit to really explore um, space. So here's the Gene Lab team uh, comprised mostly, uh, we have data processing, bioinformaticians, we have um, programmers, we have scientists, and we have um, people on our team. And um, 
we really uh, look forward to you engaging with us through our various media. Thank you. And now I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Dr. Reinsch, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how can I submit data to GeneLab? So how can I submit data to GeneLab? That's a great question. Um, so let me go back up a little ways in the slides. Um, so on our, um, let's see, sorry, on our web portal, Um, basically, uh, we have this, our, our collaborative workspace. So there's, you know, there's a little button that says submit data. Um, and you click on that, you get basically, um, you create a, um, actually create a username on this, on our website. And through there, um, you, you actually also submit an email that says what type of data you want to submit to GeneLab. Um, so currently if you, we are accepting spaceflight data, um, we also ex accept what we call spaceflight relevant data. So that can be experiments that deal with um, uh, radiation or other um, either microgravity simulations. So that could be magnetic levitation or unloading experiments or rotating wall experiments or other types of, um, of microgravity simulation experiments. Um, and so you will get a, you, Get a um, you'll get a response from somebody on the Gene Lab team who will kind of step you through the process of how to upload your data and in particular how to um, fill out the metadata forms that we have um, using the, as a creator to populate the metadata, which is very critical for all of our experiments. And right. then you basically upload the data. Uh, to the Gene Lab, it takes a couple of weeks. We actually have a, a pretty fast process now for curating the data and, and getting it released into our system. Wonderful, thank you. The next one is, is GeneLab going to host the twin study data? Well, that's a great question. Um, so as I talk a little bit here, um, one of the biggest problem with, um, with hosting human data is the de-identification of the human data. And currently, GeneLab has a little bit of human data. It's mostly cell lines. Um, and there is also, um, there are some studies that are actually uh, derived from humans. Um, so it was, uh, so metagenomics of, of, um, of kind of micro, microbiome type studies. So, but actual human data from the twin study, um, we don't have current authorization to host that, um, although there is a lot of desire to be able to host that data. Um, and as I talked about in this slide, one way is to basically keep it on the right-hand side in the red so that none of the raw data actually gets out to the public and that we only show process data about the effects. Um, and so you can't tell necessarily, you know, basically if we have everything data identified, um, but when there's only two people, it's very hard to de-identify that data. The other possibility is that we can host the data, but have it um, very controlled so that only people who are authorized to um, view the data are able to view that data. Well, thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Reinsch for her presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 10th, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.